Welcome into the program, everybody. Thank you so much for being with us this morning. I'm Caleb Cockwit, and as always, you're listening to Tactics, News Radio 1440. And we're glad to be with you this morning. Thank you so much for choosing to make us a part of your day. It is Friday, and that's something that I know we're all quite excited about. It is the weekend that is upon us. And so we're going to give you all the news that you need to get you through the weekend, and then we'll be back on Monday, hopefully. Uh, there is actually some speculation on that because, frankly, there, there's just another opportunity that I've gotten, and I may have to take a little bit of time off to be able to take full advantage of it. But, you know, this is – we're definitely going to be able to uh, give you some news about that by the beginning of the week, and, and we'll get back to you on that. But nonetheless, we do have quite a bit to get to with all the housekeeping stuff aside, so glad to be with you. 860-1440, by the way, if you do want to call in. We'd love to hear your opinions on that. Essentially, what has happened now in the past really 24 hours is the media is done hiding their dishonesty. Now, we can talk about the whole thing with Roger Stone, and we can talk about the whole thing going on behind the scenes with the Mueller investigation, but here's the thing. I'm going to avoid that because at this point, pretty much all of that is speculation. And what I mean by that is we know that he got arrested, but we don't have any details about why yet. So we could talk about it and speculate about what Mueller might have or might have or whether or not Stone is going to be indicted or not indicted on crimes that we think that he may be involved with. Uh, so let's just let's just wait a second, take a breath, take a pause and see what actually shakes out of that story before we start doing all the speculation. I actually want to get to something that we know is happening that we do have a little bit of hindsight on and we do know is going on right now. And the media has essentially gotten to the point now that they have said, you know what, we're just we're not even going to make an attempt to try to convince people that we're objective anymore. And I think maybe this is like what happens when you're with a friend, because sometimes if you criticize a friend and it's a legitimate criticism, they're going to go one way or the other. And one way that they can go is take the criticism on its face and say, you know what? You got a point. I can do better. Hopefully, that is the way that people would go. When you're criticizing a friend and you're doing so, and the best way to do that is to do it in love and to say, look, we we like you. We, we want you to be able to be successful. We want good things for you. But that's this thing that you're doing is self-destructive. This thing that you're doing isn't right. And so because of that, because we do care about you, we're letting you know that this is something that you need to stop. And I'll be the first to say that perhaps Americans in general have not always done it in exactly that spirit or that method when it comes to the media. Sometimes I think that we have been overly harsh or gotten unreasonable to a point, but the media is completely out of control. And because of that, people are trying to say, you guys are not doing your jobs. You're not doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing. You're not holding to the pledge that you're supposed to hold to when it comes to just giving us the news and letting us decide for ourselves. And unfortunately, the media has taken this criticism and done the opposite thing, the other thing that a friend can do when you come to them and tell them that they've got a problem, which is get defensive, lash out, and actually say, I don't have a problem. I don't have a problem. You're the problem. You're the problem for thinking I have a problem. Unfortunately, that seems to be the response that the media is giving. And the reason that I say this is because we're still dealing with the fallout of what's going on with the Covington kids. And we're going to touch on some new details that have come out with that that paint the media in even a worse light. So Nathan Phillips had an interview the other day on the uh, – basically they had a response to the interview with the kid that was in the video, uh, Nate, uh, Nick Sandman. And so you had Nick Sandman there on the video. He's the kid that's closest – to the Native American elder there that's banging a drum in his face. And they had an interview with him, and this is a 15-year-old kid. And you can tell the journalist there, I mean, and I use journalist with air fingers quotes there because what she was doing was clearly not journalism. 
but she has all these questions that you can tell if you are somebody that's trained in this stuff or you're somebody that pays attention to the media and somebody that, like me, has an actual degree in this stuff. You can tell that what she's trying to do is she's trying to sandbag him. She's trying to trap him in between a rock and a hard place to where no matter what answer he gives, he's going to look bad. The entire purpose of this interview, and I understand that the parents want to clear the kid's name and they want to give him some uh, some breathing room to be able to go out and, and essentially say to everybody, look, I didn't do anything wrong. This wasn't my fault. This was not the venue to do it at. They already released a statement. The statement itself was good. Having him on camera and throwing him to the lions was not a smart move by these parents. And I'm not saying that the parents are bad parents. They, I mean, obviously, I think that they're good parents because I believe their son behaved admirably in the face of a lot of adversity when he was there on the mall. But the point is, these parents are probably not people that are well-versed in media that understand that this was the purpose of it. They were not going to get a fair shake. And that interview proves that. Unfortunately, they gave another interview, a follow-up follow -up interview to Nathan Phillips, the Native American elder that did that. And they basically just let him get on there and tell his story and did not challenge him on anything, gave him no pushback. I mean, they have the raw video. We showed it on this program that they could say, well, you're saying this about the event, but if you're looking at this clip of video and then show the video and say, see, that, that doesn't really add up with what you're saying. They didn't do that in the Sandman interview either, but the reason is because none of the, none of the video contradicts anything that he said. The video, the raw footage of the event taking place contradicts quite a few things that this guy, Nathan Phillips, said in this interview, and the journalist didn't challenge him on anything, gave him no pushback. You'll notice that she also did not ask the question that she had been asking 24 hours ago to Sandman, the, the kid. She didn't ask, do you feel that you owe anybody an apology? She didn't ask any of those questions that were specifically designed to trap somebody between a rock and a hard place to where no matter what the answer is, the media goes crazy over it. I mean, this was a hatchet job if there ever was one going after this kid and painting the Native American who's an adult and he's the adult in this situation, they're treating him as though he's the victim. Which is ridiculous if you've seen the actual footage of this. By the way, we've also found out that he has lied about serving in Vietnam. There was video that was provided yesterday of him, I believe this video's a couple, maybe three years old, of him talking about him serving in Vietnam, and you'll notice that we talked about this the other day, that if you look into his actual military records, he served during the time that Vietnam was going on, but he was never deployed overseas. And another thing that was interesting that we dug up is that he was listed as AWOL three times. Not a lot of details given on that, but the point is he was listed as AWOL. So to say that he had a sterling military record or this guy is a hero and ought to be counted with the people that actually saw combat at Vietnam, no, that's not true. Did he serve? Yes. Is that an admirable thing to do? Yes. Am I trying to say that people that don't serve overseas are somehow lesser than the people that serve? No, I'm just saying that there is a difference. We need to put this into perspective. There is a difference in somebody who served honorably, especially in combat, and somebody who did not. That's all I'm saying. And... It's one thing to have served and to say and to be honest about it and say, yeah, I served my country. I never actually saw combat. I never actually went overseas. This guy lied about it. This guy lied about it to boost his political profile. And I mean, it is just absolutely horrible because the media ran with this and took his word on it and treated it as though it was a fact when he said that he was a Vietnam vet. And he claimed that. And it turns out when you dig into it that he never served and saw combat in Vietnam, nor, and, nor was his military record spotless. The guy was AWOL three different times. And this is really goes back to a larger problem with the media. And the reason that I'm using this story is because I think that it is, it is the symptom, it is indicative of a larger problem that we have with the media as a whole, which is we've essentially moved to the point to where truth doesn't really matter. Because here we have a story where we have hours, uh, we have multiple hours of video footage from different angles, from different perspectives. There is all kinds of footage of this event. And all of it 
points in one direction. It tells one story. It shows that the kids were there. They ran into these black Hebrew Israelites. The black Hebrew Israelites were jeering at them, jeering at the Native Americans. The kids, in an effort to actually quell and calm down the situation and shut down the, the crazy radical Hebrew Israelites, they actually tried to shut them down by doing their school chants, which they've done for a long time. They had a tradition of doing that for 10 years, not to drown them out, but you know that's just something that they do. And they thought, we'll, we'll use this as an opportunity to shut these guys down. And then the Native Americans show up. The kids think the Native Americans are on their side because why wouldn't they be there? They've been taunted by these black Cuban Israelites the entire day. And the kids behaved admirably didn't react, didn't get into a fracas when they were called all kinds of racial slurs that they, they didn't stoop to their level. None of that. And yet they have been rewarded only with scorn and ridicule for their actions, which I thought were very admirable. It's amazing to me that in this group of three people, these three factions, it was the children, not the adults that acted maturely. It was the children, not the adults, that acted tolerantly. And it was the adults, not the children, that went after other people. I mean, it's just amazing to me that this whole thing has taken place. And despite having all this evidence pointing in that one direction, the media continues to stick to their original narrative because they wish it to be true. They want that to be what happened. Ergo, they're going to do everything within their power to make people believe that that actually is what happened. They'd made a decision and a verdict on this before getting the information. They decided, we want this story to be true, so let's just go digging for anything that kind of supports our version of the story. I mean, it would be like, well, we really want the Earth to be the center of the universe, so let's do the best that we can to cook the books and make the numbers look like it is the center of the universe. And the facts come back, nope, doesn't bear it out. Turns out the Earth is at the center of the universe. We don't care. We want it to be true. Ergo, that's what we ought to be doing. See, that's what's so hilarious about this. The left often criticizes the right, and the media criticizes the right, and it, this is the way that they framed the March for Life, as being nothing but something, a dogma that is held on to by religious people, that they're so close-minded and they're so immune to new information that they'll just stick to their beliefs no matter what new thing comes up. And yet that's exactly what the media did in regards to this story, which is connected to the March for Life. They decided ahead of time that those people are wearing MAGA hats. Those people are a bunch of white privilege Christian, uh, you know, uh, private school kids. So they must be wrong. Regardless of what the facts say, regardless of what the video says, they're asking you to deny what you're seeing with your own eyes. And by the way, what I thought was hilarious is I actually saw media coverage that tried to paint the black Hebrew Israelites in a more positive light as well. They said they were just quoting the Bible. And I'm sitting there thinking, yeah, they're not quoting the Bible. They're spewing rhetoric about things that they believe about the Bible. And I say this is somebody that has spent an awful lot of time studying the Bible. They'll throw in a verse here and there, but the stuff that they were saying was nowhere in the Bible. They think they're Hebrews. That's how crazy they are. I mean, it's just absolutely insane. And I will say this. If the media thinks that that actually is what's in the Bible, then maybe that explains why they don't like Christians very much. Because if they believe that's what the Bible actually says, maybe that explains why they don't care for Christians. I don't know, but maybe it's a possible explanation, I guess. But the point is, they essentially have this idea that your truth is the only thing that matters. It doesn't matter what the truth is. The truth is all subjective, and it all depends on your point of view. And so if you decide that you want something to be true, then that's the thing that you should say. I mean, it kind of is reminiscent of what Harry Reid did when it came to Mitt Romney. You remember that he lied about Mitt Romney not paying his taxes. And then when asked about that lie later, even though it had been proven that Mitt Romney had paid his taxes, Harry Reid's excuse was essentially, well, Barack Obama won, won didn't he? So the ends justify the means. Doesn't matter how underhanded it is. Doesn't matter whether you're telling the truth or not, as long as you get your agenda through. And that is essentially the same 
ideology that the media has adopted. They followed in Harry Reid's footsteps, which shouldn't surprise anybody. It all goes back to this idea of postmodernism, that there is no truth. Everything's subjective. It doesn't really matter. Everything is based on your thoughts, your feelings. The truth is just subjective. And when you combine that with all these other elements that we have in the media, all the biases, you shouldn't be surprised that this is what you get. This is exactly what is churned out by a group of people that do not believe that they are subject to the truth, that they can just make up any narrative that they want to and then run with it. And they've been doing this for a long time. This is not a new occurrence. This is not a new thing. This didn't happen overnight. The difference in this story and others is that you can clearly see through the evidence. I mean, there's just a mountain of evidence against them, and it doesn't matter how much evidence. It doesn't matter how much truth is against them. They're still sticking with their original narrative. And so I think that that's the reason that this story in particular is a turning point. Because other stories, there may not have been that much evidence, or there was evidence, but it was less conclusive, or they would take the evidence and try to skew it. This is the media basically just saying, you know what, we don't even care anymore. We think that this is the narrative that should be out there. This is how the story should have played out, and because of that, that's what we're running with. It's just absolutely sickening, especially from somebody who comes from a media background. And this should be surprising to no one. In fact, we've seen several other stories that kind of back this up. For example, I found out today that Spotify, Spotify is going to be censoring PragerU. Now, for those of you who don't know about what Spotify is, Spotify is a music service. They do it based on streaming. So what you do is you subscribe to Spotify, and basically, once you've subscribed, you get to listen to whatever you want to. You can make your own playlist. It's kind of like Pandora, but Pandora is more like internet radio where you pick things that you like, and then they tailor a playlist to you. Spotify is a little bit different in that you just find music, and then if you have a Spotify account, you can just listen to it. So it's a little different in that sense. But they're basically competing services that, that offer more or less the same thing. So that's what Spotify is. And Spotify, if you don't have a subscription, you can still listen to it, but you don't get to pick your own music. And they have ads in there. So they have said now they've discontinued Prager use ads and said that they will not be accepting any new ads. No explanation. Haven't told them what terms and conditions that they have violated. All they've said is no more Prager use which seems to be at least on its onset, and I would be shocked if it was anything other than this, it seems to be just because PragerU happens to be conservative, they don't want ads going up anymore, which if you've watched any of PragerU stuff, really good stuff, it's informative, they cite all of their sources, all of their research in the video descriptions, you can look them up on YouTube, really, really good resource to have. They do different videos on things like politics, history, uh, culture, you name it. And they have some that are more opinion-based. They have some that are definitely more fact-based and more research-based. But, I mean, a really good resource. And they do tend to lean conservative, considering their founder is Dennis Prager. But nonetheless, whether they're conservative or not shouldn't matter. The fact that, seemingly, what Spotify is doing is censoring based on the content is just absolutely wrong. And this is not something that is relegated just to Spotify. Because even though Spotify is a private company, they can choose their clients if they want to. They don't have to accept PragerU. Uh, I find that dishonest. I find that maybe not dishonest per se, but definitely underhanded. That's a better way to use the word. Because I'm somebody that believes that you ought to just have open forums. You ought to not necessarily censor. For example, I'm very conservative. People know that. I mean, if you've been spending any time watching this program, you know I'm a fairly conservative dude. But if somebody wants to advertise with my program that is not conservative, that's fine. In fact, you'll remember that one of the people that bought more ads up here than anybody else last year was Martha Roby. Didn't like Martha Roby. Very critical of her. Tried to vote. Uh, I mean, I, I voted for her primary opponents, and I did not vote for her in the general election. That's how much I dislike Martha Roby. But you'll notice, during my show, awful lot of Martha Roby ads, which is fine. I mean, that is perfectly okay with me. And I told people before, whether you agree with me or not, buy all the advertising that you want to. 
have a way to counter my voice. That's fine. I believe in that. If you're going to be a media source, then you ought to be willing to invite other voices. And so in this particular case, it just really does get under my skin that Spotify, because they, they're not even necessarily a political organization, but because they seem to have a political beef with these people, they say, nope, not going to run your ads anymore. To me, that shows a lack of faith in people. Because I want people to hear my side of the story, and I want people to hear people like Martha Roby. I mean, for goodness sake, Doug Jones ran ads on our news station. And there's just about nobody I disagree with from the Alabama delegation more than Doug Jones. In fact, there is nobody that I can think of, not even the representative from Selma. But nonetheless, that's something that I believe. It ought to be an open forum. There, You ought to be able to have voices that disagree with you on your medium. And so... Because of that, I just don't think that uh, I just don't think that Spotify is in the right on this. Even though I think they have the right to do it, I don't think that they are acting morally correctly. And media censorship and blacklisting has essentially already begun. I don't know if you saw this week, but earlier, Microsoft announced that it is doing this with uh, what is it? News NewsGuard? Yeah, NewsGuard is their new program. And so what they're doing is they're an internet browser. They have the Microsoft Edge. So you remember Internet Explorer, that kind of went by the wayside, and now they have what's known as Microsoft Edge. And if you're, most of my audience tends to be younger, they tend to be millennials. And I understand that most of us, we don't really use the Microsoft default browser. Some of us do, but a lot of us will use Google Chrome, a lot of us will use Mozilla Firefox. The vast majority of Internet users, especially in the older generation, they just use whatever default browser their computer comes with, which is fine. Nothing wrong with that. But that means that there are going to be an awful lot of people that are using Microsoft Edge. It is the most used Internet Explorer, uh, Internet browser that you have. And so now what's going to happen is you have this thing called NewsGuard. And so there are certain sites that they have vetted, vetted with what they refer to as a panel of trained journalists. Sorry, I don't know why my phone can even receive phone calls right now. Um, so you have a panel of trained journalists that are on this thing, and they make decisions on what sites are trustworthy and not trustworthy. And so if you're on a trustworthy news site, then you get a green check mark. If you're in a news site that is not trustworthy, you get a red shield. And so what they're doing is they're not technically making it to where you can't see the content, but they're trying to place that little bit of doubt in your mind. And if you're wondering about what the filtering process is like, they'll say that the checkmark ones, those are sites you can trust. The uh, ones with the red shield, those are the ones that are known to post information that is not correct. So let's look at the list of the ones that, have the green check mark and which ones have the red shield. You know who has the green check mark? Guys like CNN, but you know who else has it? Huffington Post and Slate. Very, very left leaning sites. And Huffington Post, most of their side is opinion. Now, I read Huffington Post. I think that it's important to get the other side's view on it. But let's not pretend that Huffington Post is an objective news site. Most of their stuff is opinion, and they don't even cite it as opinion. They'll just present it as though it's a, a hard news story, but it's really just the opinion of the people at Huffington Post, which, again, is fine. I think it's a good resource. I want to hear what people on the left have to say, but to try to say that they're trustworthy and that sites like Daily Wire and The Blaze are not – to say that those sites you can't trust, those get the big red shield with the exclamation point letting people know this isn't a trustworthy site. You see, this is the start of the downward spiral. We're kind of on that crisp, uh, or sorry, that, that cusp of the downward slope. If you've ever seen, uh, if you've been on a roller coaster, you know that initial hill that they go up to and you just kind of hang there a little bit before you start going down. That's where we are right now when it comes to media censorship, because you can rest assured that suit is going to be followed and it'll get to the point to where they're not just going to have a little red shield up in the corner. It's going to be where they give you a warning, warning, this site is not trustworthy. 
And there are going to be people that read that and misinterpret it and think, oh, well, this site has viruses or something like that, and then not go to it. And what you're going to see is big tech companies following suit with this. Because if Microsoft will do it, you'll know that Facebook and Twitter and some of these other social media sites are going to do the same pretty soon. They've already been pretty notorious for censoring conservative voices already. We've already have in had incidents of this happening to me in particular as well. But see, what you're going to see happening, what you're going to see happening is that when they start following suit, they're going to start doing it in an even more sneaky way. They're going to start building a wall that you don't even see because you'll just kind of notice that, hey, you know, it's been a while since I've seen an article from Daily Wire. It's been a while since I've seen an article from Drudge. It's been a while since I've seen an article from The Blaze. That's what you're going to start seeing. You're going to start noticing that your newsfeed just doesn't have a whole lot of conservative news anymore. That's odd because it's going to be an unverified site. Well, the, these are the sites that we believe that you should be reading because they're more trustworthy. This is how we're fighting fake news. Well, here's the problem. Fake news has been generalized far too much because back when it was started, what fake news meant was sites that intentionally put up misleading stories. In other words, stories that they just made up out of nowhere. So if they just, for example, this is a good example, actually. If you've ever eaten at Joe Mama's in Millbrook, great, store, uh, great restaurant, really good burgers. I recommend the Joe Daddy if you ever go there. So a little free plug for them. So Joe Mama's, little place in Millbrook that people know, there was a fake news site that put up a story that Bill Murray, you know, star of Ghostbusters and a lot of other movies, Groundhog Day, all that good stuff, um, and Space Jam, too. But anyway, uh, they put up a story that Bill Murray was, for whatever reason, driving through central Alabama, and he had to stop because he had a problem with his car, and they mentioned a local repair shop. I forget which one it was, but it was one very near Joe Mama's, so I think uh, maybe Gibson's over there. And so he had to stop and get his car repaired, and then he walked across the street and went to Joe Mama's, which was a really good, he said it was a really good burger. And so they presented this as though it was real news, but it had all the tells of fake news if you were really looking, but it's a fairly convincing side. And I can understand how somebody not trained in this stuff would very easily fall for that. And for a second, I fell for it. And I'm somebody that is trained in this stuff. That's what fake news used to mean. People that are intentionally just making stories up. It's a site that doesn't have any credibility. It's just made up by some random person that wants to make it look like real news, but isn't really news. Now we've taken fake news to mean news that I disagree with or news that I believe doesn't provide the proper context. And that's why I tell people, be careful when you call CNN and other sites like that fake news, because sometimes I do think they engage in things that are fake news. But that's rare. And... Uh, this story with uh, with Nathan Phillips and the Covington boys would be an example of that. But by and large, they stick to pretty fact-based stuff, even if they have a spin on it, even if they're selective in what stories they give you. That's not technically fake news in the truest sense. But now what they're trying to do to combat fake news is to basically just get rid of all the people that they disagree with. And so they're just using the moniker fake news to anybody that is presenting a side of the story that they don't think is correct. And so when they look at a story and say, there's kind of a conservative bend to this one, we don't like it. In their mind, that is fake news. And that's the problem that you're running into here. And here's the problem. They have the journalist censoring the journalist. It's sort of this idea of academic inbreeding to where they're saying, well, the journalists are writing the stories. Who gets to decide whether or not those stories are true or not? Who's to decide which story should be trusted and which sites should be trusted and which one shouldn't. The journalist. Oh, so the journalists are going to tell us that the journalist is right. Okay. Well, that doesn't make any sense. That would be like a, a review board for a government organization being the same people that they're reviewing. So we're going to be the ones reviewing what we gave you, and we're going to be the ones that tell you that it's good. Perfect example. We just had a bunch of award shows because it was the beginning of the year. Do you notice that at the Golden Globes and the Oscars and all these other award shows that it's a bunch of actors and actresses and directors voting on what's good and what's not? 
and they constantly pick movies that the American people don't like, that didn't make any money, that nobody saw. See, that's the people in the industry telling you that the things that the people in the industry put out are good. No, we promise it's good. Well, I, I saw it and I didn't like it. doesn't matter. We're telling you it's good. And so this is another example of sort of that academic inbreeding where the journalists are the ones that are telling us that the journalists can be trusted. Well, who told you the journalist can be trusted? The journalist. Well, who's going to monitor the journalist? The journalist. The journalist will tell you which journalists are good, and the journalists will tell you which journalists are bad. Well, who gets a seat at the table? Well, not the ones at the bad sites, because, you know, they can't be trusted. Well, then, how do they have a voice? That's the thing they don't. That's the trick in all of this is that it's a bunch of people from CNN and MSNBC telling you that CNN and MSNBC are trustworthy. Oh, well, that makes me feel better. It's absolutely ridiculous. And it all comes back to this. The people in their ivory towers at Microsoft and soon, I'm sure, because Facebook has dabbled in this a little bit, Twitter has dabbled in this a little bit, they're going to be the ones that tell you that you're just not smart enough to make your own decisions. You're just not smart enough to decide what news is trustworthy and which one is not. You're not smart enough on your own to decide what you should be reading and what you shouldn't be reading. And so here, we'll take the burden off of you. We'll tailor this to you so that you can just have whatever it is that you need when it comes to these news stories. We'll give you what you need to know. You don't get to decide for yourself. And that's where this is heading. And I can say this is somebody that has been censored quite a bit myself. For example, I know that uh, you remember that we had the Gillette story not too long ago. So the Gillette ad that came out that was talking about, quote unquote, toxic masculinity. I'm not going to go through the whole story again. If you want, you can go back and, and look at that story yourself. But Gillette got very mad at me because I ran their ad during my show. But I wasn't running the ad to run the ad. I wasn't showing it so that I would get more views or just, you know, putting it in a video and showing just the ad itself. I was providing political commentary, which is protected under the fair use laws. And it's protected under federal law. So I'm not violating their copyright by showing their ad to provide context to my commentary. And yet Gillette tried to get that video demonetized so that I couldn't make any money off of it. And what they did was they said, we're going to get the copyright claim because we made the content. And if you fight us on it and you lose, then we're going to have your YouTube account deleted. Your, your YouTube account is going to be subject to deletion. I fought them anyway. And thankfully, I wound up winning that claim. But the point is, that's how they get people. They scare them into not even fighting. They say, if you fight us, we can delete your YouTube account. We can take away your entire livelihood. And that's how they scare people into submission. And that's because Gillette did not like the fact that there were a whole bunch of conservative commentators talking about how stupid that ad was. And so thankfully I was able to win that one. But I mean, it just, it does go to show you that there are people out there that don't like it when people talk about them in a negative light. And because of that, they do try to silence their voices because they're big and powerful and have a lot of influence and you're not. And when you're on these secondary mediums like YouTube, like Facebook, like Twitter, then that's something that you have to deal with. Facebook has censored me a couple times. I've talked about that on the show. Uh, one of the claims they actually did reverse and another claim that they didn't. They claimed that I was engaged in hate speech and all kinds of other crazy stuff that wasn't true. When it comes to YouTube, I'm convinced that YouTube is censoring my search results. If you don't believe me, when you get a chance... Go on YouTube, search for my name, Caleb Colquitt, because if you search for Tactics Radio, granted, you will get my channel. But if you search for Caleb Colquitt, that is a tag in every single one of my videos. You'll notice that you have to get to like page seven before you actually find one of my videos, even though they have more views than a lot of the videos that you're seeing get pinged ahead of mine. So I thought, well, maybe it's just because these videos are old. And so I actually filtered my search results to put it to the last couple of weeks. And you know what? They still had videos with one and two views ahead of one of mine that had a, over a thousand. And so it doesn't seem to me a coincidence, especially since I've had YouTube accounts in the past that talked about things that weren't about politics 
And somehow I was able to find those videos right away. Somehow those videos didn't wind up behind a wall in the search engine. But when I'm behind a video of a kid talking into his phone that's like 12 seconds long and has no views because he's going to Cockwood County, Georgia. And so I'm using my name and the last name. His doesn't even have the first tag in it. Clearly something is happening there. Clearly I'm behind some kind of search engine wall. And so this isn't just bellyache or wine or whatever, but I'm saying that if they're censoring, they're already censoring voices that they don't approve of. And that's the problem that you're running into. And it's so sad. It is so sad because the great thing about the internet was always that it got rid of the gatekeepers. It got rid of the people that said, no, you're not allowed to be on our network. You're not allowed to be on our TV station. You're not allowed to be on our radio station. It got rid of those gatekeepers to where anybody could go on there and have their voice and, and have their story told. But now they're getting to the point to where they're trying to stop that. They're trying to end that relationship that you used to have between you and the viewer. They're trying to end that communication and they're trying to filter it through their idea of what it ought to be. And so in effect, they have become the new gatekeepers. The great thing about the internet was that it was this big free open frontier that anybody could go out and make their own little space in it. And now the gatekeepers are trying to keep people that they deem unworthy of that off. And it really is a shame. You may not have heard about the new law that has passed in the state of New York. And what New York has done is you, we talked about it on this program about three, maybe four days ago, I think. Governor Andrew Cuomo was really pushing hard for and, in fact, threatening to shut down the government, shut down the New York state government if he didn't get his way on this. The Reproductive Rights Act or, or whatever else it was called, but essentially what it would do is it allows abortions up until the point of birth. And as horrific as that is, because the only places in the world that you can go to get completely unlimited access to abortion like that, there's only four nations in the world where you can do that. By the way, the United States is one of them. Now, in a practical application, you can have more restrictions at the state level. But New York is now one of the... Uh, there's only six countries in the world that have unfettered access before partial birth abortion. Under New York's law, if it weren't for the federal law, the federal prohibition against par partial birth abortion, then under New York law, that would actually be allowable. And so it is just absolutely reprehensible what New York has done. And I think possibly the bigger part of the story that isn't being covered nearly as much is that the abortion law, the new one that has been passed, also removes abortion from any of the criminal code. Now, for a lot of people, that may not seem all that important, but I want you to think about this. And I think that even people on the left that are pro-choice, I think even they would see the problem with this. Removing abortion from the criminal code would also mean that this is not a violation of the law. There was a crime that was committed, uh, really a crime against humanity in general, but a crime that was committed just recently, I think it was sometime last year, that there was a boyfriend who was the father of a child, and he wanted the child to not exist. He wanted the woman to get an abortion, and she didn't. So what he did was he met with her and slipped a part of a what we would call a Plan B pill, so an abortion pill, into her drink. And this was pretty early in the pregnancy process, but she wound up losing the baby as a result of that. Well, now, under New York law, that would not even be illegal. For example, here's another one. If you have somebody that owns a sex slave who has a, a child sex slave, or actually this would be true of an adult sex slave as well, but if you have one of those and you, as the owner of, of that person, and I'm using that in the non-legal sense, somebody that controls that person, they could go and make that person have an abortion and, of course, sex slavery is illegal, and so you could bring them up on that charge. But the abortion itself would not be a crime, would not be illegal, even though you're threatening this person to be able to get it. Same thing that would be true of a, a boyfriend or a partner or a husband that wants to force a woman to get an abortion that doesn't want one. That's not a crime anymore. And so there is a myriad of unintended consequences that I think even most people on the left would not agree with, with this law being passed. And what is really tragic 
And this made just a very powerful point, so I want to show this. Uh, this is a tweet from the Susan B. Anthony, their organization, the Susan B. Anthony List. How tragic New York Governor Cuomo orders World Trade Center to be let pink to celebrate the new law in New York permitting unborn babies to be killed by abortion up till birth, while the Washington Trade Center or while the uh, World Trade Center Memorial below bears the name of 11 unborn children who lost their lives in the 9/11 attack. And the reason I think that makes such a powerful point is because it recognizes the personhood and the loss of life for those children in 9-11, and yet we're saying that they're not people when it's inconvenient. So when it's convenient or when we believe that a, a life has been lost, then we recognize it as a life. But when it's a woman that just wants to kill her own child, then it's not a life? That doesn't make any sense. You don't honor the loss of life if there's not a life there to begin with. And unfortunately, in the explanation that someone on the left would give to you, is that, well, it's because the women in those cases, they wanted their babies. Oh, oh, so wanting the person to be there is what determines whether or not your life has value. Because if that's the case, there are really horrible, evil parents that kill their own children that are already born. If that's the case, and that's the standard that we're going to bear, if you have a two-year-old and a five-year-old and it's just really difficult and you don't have the money to support them anymore and you're convinced that because you can't provide a good life for them, they're going to grow up to be criminals and all this other stuff, all the other excuses that we hear when it comes to why we should allow abortion, what's the difference in killing the unborn baby then and, and now? If the standard that you're going to use is that the mother wanted them, well then what is the difference in we have, you know, big court cases and uh, covers the media covers it for weeks when a parent murders their child and the child goes missing for a while. Well, what's wrong with that? I mean, if the parent didn't want their kid anymore and that's the standard that we're using, then what, why was it wrong for them to lock that child up in a trunk and take them out in the woods and bury them? I mean, yeah, that's horrific and evil, but that's the point. Why is one act horrific and evil and one is perfectly okay and ought to be allowed by law? There is no consistent standard there. And the value of your life, the value of your existence cannot be, t uh, cannot be contingent on the desires of other people because then it's not really your life. Then it's somebody else's life. And another argument that you'll hear all the time is dependency. That, well, the difference is that a baby inside the mother is dependent upon the mother. You don't think a newborn is dependent on their mother? You don't think a one-year-old or a two-year-old is dependent upon their mother? And so that's the point. Anytime you draw a line other than conception, and you're saying that the standard there is whether or not the parent wants it or not, it's a false line. It's a line that cannot be consistent if you bear that logic out to its, its natural conclusion. All right, uh, looks like we have somebody on the phone, so let's go ahead to line one. Good morning. What's your name? Hey, it's John. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hello? Hello? Hey. Oh, there you are. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I just uh, wanted to bring up a couple of things. You remember several years ago, maybe you don't, it's been a while now, but the mother drowned her children. I think it was four or five children that she drowned in Texas. Mm -hmm. And people all over the country, some of the examples we could give about this, that just make our skin crawl when somebody what somebody does to children. Yeah, and it should. It, 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 it should, of course. But so does this. And it's just any time you open up something evil, more evil will come as a result. Mm -hmm. And that's just the way that things that I've observed in life, that's the way it is. And it's just tragic that they're doing this in New York. And they're all excited about it, too. Uh, they think that that's the way that it should be and are celebrating their victory in that. Well, I've heard them talk about it. Well, I, and I'm sure that you know about this, uh, being a, a Bible scholar yourself. That's a pretty common theme in the Scripture. It was not uncommon at all yeah. for when a great sin took place for people to be celebrating. The golden calf is a great example. I mean, they, 
that they they had a great sin, something that was clearly against God's will, and in response, they had a big party and celebrated. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's just how it is. Sin is often and, uh, accompanied by celebration. There will be other copycat states, too. There already are, actually. Vermont has a very similar bill in the works now. Yeah, so uh, what a tragic situation. I mean, it really is. Yeah. Uh, it, people to, to uh, say that they are certainly in favor of people on the border and they want people to come to the country and be treated well and they hate separation of parents and children at the border. And then on the other side of the ledger, then they are in favor of something like this. I just, I don't get that at all. Well, and that's one thing that I don't understand. You remember that when we were having the border debate and there was the migrant caravan that showed up at the wall, um, even though it was the parent that put the person in danger, they were horrified at the idea that children might have got hit with some tear gas, which, you know, if it can at all be avoided, I would be against that as well. But sure. what's you're talking about a child that is still with their parent, and their parent is the one that brought them there, that may have been hit by tear gas, which will sting for a few minutes and then go away. But you're perfectly okay with just snuffing out a child's life to where it'll never even see the light of day? That doesn't make any sense. I mean, I think, I, I seriously, I, you and I disagree on this, but I think you need to be graphic about it and show a depiction on television. Where no, I, no, I do agree with that. It. I don't disagree do with you on that at all. Okay. Well, I think we need to see some things like that to show people how terrible that is to have a baby coming out of the womb and killing the baby. I mean, that's a horrible thing to think about, but it's actually ha- going to be happening. Yeah, well, I mean, part of the reason that they were able to keep the Holocaust going as long as they were is that pictures and footage of what was actually happening didn't get out into the general public. They kept it behind closed doors. And because those horrors were hidden by everybody that wasn't there, that's part of the reason that they were able to keep public support in Germany uh, of it up for as long as they did. Yeah. And so putting it on display... I mean, pointing the flash, uh, pointing the spotlight directly on the evil that is taking place. I'm totally in favor of that. And I, one thing you mentioned while we go about wanting the child, and that's the criteria. Right. What about people that have mentally challenged children? Well, I mean, if you, if somebody got rid of one of those those people because they didn't like them or they got tired of taking care of them, then I. You know, you, you just open up an incredible can of worms, as we say, with something like that. It's just ridiculous. Well, that's the thing. Down syndrome children are virtually non-existent in certain country, countries in Europe, not because they figured out a way to cure Down syndrome, but because what they're doing is they're just aborting the children before they're born. Yeah. And, I mean, if that's not just absolutely horrific that because somebody has a disability that that's the reason that you want to kill them. If that's the standard, then what's the difference in killing a child in the womb that has Down syndrome and killing a child that's five or six years old that has Down syndrome? I'd take a Down syndrome child over Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer any day of the week. Amen. Thank you so much for your call. I appreciate it. It is a sad state of affairs that we find ourselves in, but it does seem, to go to John's point there, that Democrats seem to only really care about children's lives when it's politically expedient or it suits their political interest. You see, when it's a child on the border or a child in Guatemala, then it's really, really important to talk about preserving children's lives. Or if it's a child that has been horrifically traumatized or shot in a school shooting or a mass shooting of some kind, then children's lives are really important. But now they're celebrating the mass slaughter of children and the snuffing out of their lives. And so it is a horribly inconsistent stance to take. And furthermore, I think another thing that we should point out is that Catholics have now called for, because Governor Andrew Cuomo is a Catholic and he was the one pushing for this. Catholics have now called for the, I guess he's the bishop or the archbishop over this particular area. Uh, no, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm getting that wrong. Uh, Cardinal Timothy Do- uh, Dolan, they're saying that he ought to excommunicate Governor Cuomo, 
which I know almost absolutely nothing about Catholic church discipline. I know what the Bible teaches, and I know what it says about church discipline, but I don't know how the Catholics view that or, or the way that they do that. Uh, I'm not real sure about their superstructure and, and who has to do that and how that works. But I got to say this. If supporting this policy and pushing for it and making this the law in New York doesn't qualify someone for excommunication from the church, I have no idea what would. I cannot think of something else that would result in an excommunication from the church if this doesn't. I really can't. If you're going to allow this to go on and continue to have this person refer to themselves as somebody that is a member of the Catholic Church there, I honestly cannot think of anything that would justify an excommunication more than this. I mean, these are horrific crimes against humanity. And they should be treated as such. And if the Catholic Church wants to portray this image of a consistent organization that practices what it preaches and really does believe that abortion is murder, then I don't see how you can't excommunicate this guy. So that is the way that I would, I would handle it. I mean, if, if this were happening at my church, and I know that my church is autonomous, but if this were happening at my church and there was a person that was going out, beating the drum, making sure that this became the law of the land, like Governor Cuomo is, and my elders didn't excommunicate that person, I would leave that church. I'm just telling you how I would react. But nonetheless, that is the, it's really the result of nihilism. It's really the result of all of these horrific things that we're seeing because we do not value human life anymore. We have a travesty in our society that human life is no longer to be respected. And there's a number of different ways you can see this playing out. You can see it in school shootings. You can see it in other kinds of mass shootings. People no longer respect human life or view it as intrinsically valuable the way that they used to. Another great example of that would be suicides, drug abuse, nihilism. People don't see their own lives as important the way that they once did. They don't view themselves as an image bearer of God, something that was created. They don't see themselves as a being that was created by a creator for a specific purpose. And because of that, if you believe you're just a bag of meat that evolved from apes you know, several million years ago, and that once you're gone, there's nothing left, then yeah, it all does seem pretty pointless. If that's your worldview, then yeah, you can kind of understand why people don't view life as intrinsically valuable. I mean, at that point, nothing really does matter, and that's why nihilism can kind of, I don't know, leech its way into society that way. And unfortunately, this is just one more symptom, abortion is, of this larger disease to where we do not value human life the way that our creator intended for us to. On the shutdown, though, I do have to talk about that a little bit today. I'm guessing Trump's going to cave. And I'm guessing he's going to cave pretty soon because uh, he's already announced today that he is going to delay the State of the Union. Said that it was reasonable for Nancy Pelosi to suggest that. And so he's going to delay his State of the Union until after, the, uh, after that particular time, which suggests one of two things. Either he's going to stick to the government shutdown and just not do the State of the Union until later, which doesn't sound very Trump-esque to me. Maybe I'm reading this wrong, but it sounds to me like that's what he's saying. And the reason that he's saying that is because he expects the government shutdown to be done before January 29th. So if that's the case, and especially considering that there have been some meetings going on in D.C., I think that what's going to happen is Trump is about to cave. He's about to give in. And part of the reason that I say that is because he has just announced that he's planning a $7 billion emergency spending bill for the border wall. And I think that what you're seeing here is he's going to go ahead and reopen the government and try to do it through emergency action, through a crisis situation, which is a bad idea on a couple of different levels. One level is that it sets a bad precedent. Because if the president can just basically with a stroke of his pen, you say, you know what, this is an emergency situation, so I'm going to go ahead and spend money regardless of what Congress wants to do. Well, if the president can do that, then what's to stop the next president? Let's say that the next president is, God forbid, Kamala Harris, 
just throwing a name out there. Let's say that she gets an office and says, you know what? Global warming is going to be a crisis. It is an emergency situation. I mean, Alexandria Ocasio, of course, says, says that the world's like going to like end in like 12 years and you're worried about like how to pay for it. So if we're going with the Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez standard, where the world is just going to be a giant fireball in 12 years unless we do something, then Kamala Harris could say, oh, yeah, that's absolutely a crisis situation. You know what? I'm going to spend $10 billion on a new green jobs deal. Well, what's the difference? If the president can just do that on a whim with a stroke of his or her pen, then what's to stop the next president from doing that? And so that's one of the reasons that I oppose Trump basically using the emergency powers to spend money like this. It sets a bad precedent for the future. And any time that you support an executive action, you have to stop and think, okay, the executive is amassing power here. Would I be okay with it if it were a different person in office? Same thing with the judiciary, same thing with the legislative. If they're doing something that consolidates power into one branch of the government away from the other branches, in other words, they're taking on a role that another branch is supposed to do, you have to sit down and ask yourself, if it were going away that I didn't want to, would I be okay with it? Because in this particular case, I would say absolutely not. Look, Trump is not going to be president forever. He's got... A couple years left in his term now, maybe he wins another term, I don't know, but either way, at the end of eight years, for sure he's going to be out. And somebody else will be president, and if history is any teacher, it will probably be a Democrat. And so because of that, it is important for us to sit down and think about these things and actually reason them out. If we allow the executive to just go forth and do whatever it is he wants to with this emergency funding... That is going to be a problem for us later on. And another problem that I have with this particular funding uh, ability is I don't think it's going to be effective. Like you already have the problem of it being a bad precedent, which is the reason that it needs to go through Congress. But even if you take that factor out of it completely, you're still left with a secondary problem. And I believe that that secondary problem is that you're going to have it challenged in the court basically immediately with a lot of the activist justices and judges that Obama put in place. And we've seen this happen with numerous uh, on numerous times with the executive orders that Trump has signed that somebody, some liberal judge is going to stand up and say, Nope, that's illegal. Can't do that. And then it's going to be stalled. And then you don't get the wall because now you have a Democrat house that's in charge of all the spending measures. And you no longer have that bargaining token of the government shutdown to use. And so if that takes place, if this is Trump's play, the wall doesn't get built. Now, maybe he tries to spin it in such a way to say, well, look, I did everything that I could. But if he caves right now, he didn't do everything that he could. If he caves right now, then he did not do everything within his power to get that wall built. And I think that politically and from a practicality standpoint, this is one of the dumbest moves that the president could make. Oh, uh, looks like we got Blaine, one of my fraternity brothers, commented on the uh, on the post here. Keep up the awesome work, Caleb. Good logic and moral ideals will win in the end. Well, that's certainly true because Jesus is going to come back someday. So <laughs> good morals and logic will win out. It just may take a little while. But uh, thank you for the compliment, Blaine. Certainly appreciate you being here and all of you that are listening to me, viewing us through Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Periscope. I mean, all kinds of venues, Twitch. I'm sure we've got some Twitch listeners out there as well. Thank you so much for being with us. We are going to go ahead and go to our daily dose of stupid. That was stupid. I know it was stupid. Really stupid. Hey, I just said it was stupid. Today's daily dose of stupid there was some art that was taken down because of some violence, but it's probably not the story that you would have expected me to tell. So there's an artist named Janie Lee, uh, Lion, Liononen. I have no idea how to pronounce this. Uh, I think it's an Aramic name. Anyway, Janie, uh, Liononen made a sculpture of Ronald McDonald on a cross. So a, a big crucifix and they did it, Kind of like you'll, you'll see some classic statues of, of Christ in a cathedral. They have in the same position Ronald McDonald with his hands out. I, I thought about showing you the actual piece, but it's very offensive. It's I, I, I don't know. I didn't feel right 
actually putting it out there. But as you can imagine, it's it's very blasphemous, very derogatory. And this is the particular statue that was put up on display in a museum. And it caused a lot of controversy, as you can imagine. It was hung in the Hafei uh, Haifa. Sorry, Haifa. Yeah, that's how to say it. Sorry, when we're dealing with stuff in the Middle East, I have a hard time. I have a hard time with the language. The Haifa Museum of Art in Israel. So, to be sure, the piece is wildly offensive. Not something that I would recommend anybody go see. But last week they decided to take it down after Christian protesters had attacked police. And they actually do have video footage of people that at least claim Christianity that are attacking police officers. But here's the thing. I despise this piece as much as they do. I mean, I think it's detestable that this guy put this on here to mock the savior of, of mankind, Jesus Christ. But I also think it's despicable to engage in violence over something like this. And these people that refer to themselves as Christians are not acting very Christ-like. If Jesus Christ himself could face down a mob that was beating him and spitting on him and lying about him and slandering his name and referring to him as a blasphemer and somebody that was against God and beat him with rods and put a robe on him and a crown of thorns and mock him and then murder him for crimes he didn't commit, and none of that elicited a violent response from Jesus, I think that we as his disciples shouldn't be hurting other people, hurting our fellow man over something as stupid as a sculpture. I mean, I'm not saying that the sculpture in any way is okay. I believe that it's evil. I believe that it's wrong. And I believe that the person that made it is going to have to answer for that one day. But I also believe that we're going to have to answer for our actions. And we can't control what other people do. But we can control how we react to it. And freaking out like this because somebody mocked Christ, remember that the whole story of Christ is people mocking Christ. The whole story of the crucifixion, reading any part of that and seeing how Jesus reacted to it should be a warning sign to these people who claim to be Christians and claim to be followers of Jesus and yet act in the exact opposite way of the way that our Savior acted. If he could stand there and take the mocking and we're supposed to be models of Christ, we're supposed to live the way that he lived and use him as our example and our guideline as we go through this life, then attacking somebody over a statue that you don't agree with, especially when the person that you're attacking is just doing his job and didn't actually, you know, make the statue. That is so far beyond the pale when it comes to Christianity. And the reason that I call these guys out and the reason that I'm being harsh on them is I think it's more important to call out our own because you'll notice that one of the groups in history that God got most angry about were the Romans good people. Absolutely not. They were doing some really reprehensible things. But even though God was angry with the Romans in the time of Christ, you know who he was far more angry with? The Pharisees and the Jewish elders. Why? The stuff that they were doing on its surface didn't seem as bad. They weren't oppressing anybody. They weren't taking over a country. And they were doing all this stuff in God's name. But they were tying heavy burdens around people's necks and saying that they weren't good enough for God. They painted a very dim and incorrect picture of who God was and what it was to follow his laws. And because they were doing that and because they did so in God's name, they pretended to be people that spoke for God. That's why God got angry with them more than anybody else. And so I do hold Christians to a higher standard because I believe that if we don't hold ourselves to a higher standard than we hold the world, then people are going to think that we're just another part of the world. Stuff like this makes people think that Christians are no better than Muslims or any other religious group. Hindus, whatever. Not that you see a whole lot of riots from Hindus. It happens, but, you know, not really for their religion per se. But my point in all of this is we have to hold people that refer to themselves as Christians to a higher standard because the idea that they were doing this in God's name is just absolutely incorrect. And to anybody that's an outsider looking into this, they get a very incorrect, skewed view of who God really is and what's important to him. Because at the end of the day, Jesus wanted disciples, not an angry mob. That being said, we'll go ahead and go to the chaplain's report. 
1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Chaplain's Report today comes from the book of Luke. And I know that we've been going through the book of Daniel and we're going to continue on that on our next show. But I did want to take a break from that because I think that this passage really relates to the story that we were just looking at. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and look in the Gospel of Luke at uh, verses, sorry, chapter 9, verses 52 through 56. And he sent messengers on ahead of him, and they went and entered the village of the Samaritans to make arrangements for him. But they did not receive him because he was traveling toward Jerusalem. When his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them and said, You do not know what kind of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went on to another village. So, to understand this, you do have to understand that the Samaritans and the Jews did not necessarily get along. The Jews were half-breeds, they were part Israelite, but they were also other stuff. They had kind of lost their heritage, they had lost the lineage of being able to trace their blood back to Abraham. And because of that, they were viewed mostly with disdain from Jewish people. And this primarily Samaritan village is along the way back to Jerusalem. The disciples and Jesus are traveling back there, and they come across this town, and they want nothing to do with him. And they scorned him. And James and John, rightfully so, they get angry about it. They get upset about it. And then they say to Jesus, so should we start calling down fire from heaven like Sodom and Gomorrah or other events that have happened in the Bible? And Jesus just looks at them like, you guys have it backwards. I mean, yeah, it's not right that they rejected us. Yeah, it's not right that they didn't want anything to do with us. But you were of the wrong spirit. You were of the wrong spirit when you take, you want to lash out against other people and take vengeance upon them. Because it is important for us to remember as people of faith that do we really believe that God is going to judge and reign supreme in the end? Because if we do, then we don't really have to get worried. We don't really have to be worried about people, quote unquote, getting away with something. We don't have to worry about being the avenger or enacting justice on people. I'm not saying that we don't enact justice as a society because we certainly do. But I'm just saying that there seems to be a mentality amongst many people that we want to make sure that nobody ever gets away with anything. But at the end of the day, even if someone does get away with something, at least from the world's perspective, remember that if they're doing something that is against God's will, they're going to have to answer for that one day. And also, it does not befit a Christian to be overly eager to deal out death and judgment. That's not something that is should be done gleefully, nor should it be done with a eagerness. And so because of that, I think that when we do judge, and this is the example that the scripture gives and the example that, that Jesus modeled for us, we do so in a loving and compassionate way. doesn't mean you sacrifice the truth, doesn't mean you hold things back, but it does mean that you tell them in such a way that you communicate with them, we're not trying to hurt you, we're trying to help you get better. We're trying to help you leave this self-destructive behavior that you're involved in. None of that spirit was in James and John when they said this. And because they were supposed to know better, they were followers of Christ, they were disciples, they had been around Jesus for a, a pretty good period at this point. Because they were supposed to know better, Jesus is disappointed in them and rebukes them pretty harshly. But see, that's the difference. When James and John wanted to destroy this town, when they were upset that this town wasn't being destroyed with fire from heaven, See, they made that suggestion out of anger. Jesus made his suggestion to them that they change the way that they think and the way that they react to things out of love. Because he wanted James and John to be better people. And of course, having the hindsight of the entire narrative of the Bible, we know that they certainly did become that. 
James, of course, being executed as a martyr, and John being someone who wrote a pretty big portion of the New Testament. And so because of that, we really do come to an understanding of the difference in these two. The James and John lashed out. Jesus instructed. He made it into a teaching moment. And that's really the difference in these two and the way that they were seeing this, because had James and John adopted the spirit of Christ, they may have been rightfully upset that they were being rejected, but not because it was a personal slight against them, but because they were rejecting the Savior of the world. They were rejecting something that would have been good and beneficial for them. And that's the mind of Christ that we see portrayed in the scriptures. You see, we ought to call evil out whenever we see it, regardless of who's doing it. But remember that we are primarily messengers, not avengers. Not saying there's never a time to enact justice, not saying there's never a time to enact church discipline or tell people that they're wrong. All I'm saying is remember that the ultimate judgment is one that we are not going to be in charge of. And I thank God that I'm not in that position. Stay the course, friends. <laughs>